In the 1940s, there was a, a, an owner of a tool manufacturing company, a guy called David Brown, who decided he wanted to invest and own a car manufacturer. And he, in 1947, bought this, Aston Martin, for the pricely sum of £30,000. And in his 25 years of ownership, left a legacy of the DB series, after his initials, that commenced back in the 50s and into the 60s, and all the way through into this generation. Mid-2000s, they brought out the latest, the 5.9-litre V12 Aston Martin DB9. And this week, we're reviewing it, and I can't wait. Welcome to this week's Fast and Fun. So the DB9 came out in 2004 as a successor to the DB7. And you may think, well, why didn't they naturally call it the DB8? And there's a very good reason for that. Because they were feared that if they called it the 8, people would think it had 8 cylinders, a V8 under the bonnet. When in actual fact, the DB9 would have 12. A V12, a 5.9 litre V12, producing in its first guise 450 brake horsepower. Although there were two uplifts around 2009-2013 during the 12-year production run of the DB9, running from 2004 all the way to 2016. This one, this is a 2005, it has only got 30,000 miles on the clock, it has been owned from new by one owner and so this is one of the best examples out there at the moment. Front-engined rear-wheel drive through either a six-speed manual, which were very rare, the vast majority came as a six-speed automatic, a torque converter automatic, and it came as either a coupe or the convertible. And in Aston Martin speak, that was always called the Volante. The DB9 also came with a fully bonded aluminium chassis, which made the car super rigid. In fact, apparently it, was, it provides twice the torsion rigidity of the earlier DB7, but comes in at 25% less weight. Now that's an incredible feat. For the Volante, the convertible, that, the, the structure of it obviously had to be strengthened to keep its rigidity, and which did increase weight. Um, but as a result of that stiffening even further, they had to fit on the Volante models softer springs and softer anti-roll bars just to give it a little bit more compliance on the road. One of the interesting points with the Volante is should you be in a serious accident in a rollover position, they have pop-up hoops, crash hoops that pop up whether you've got roof up or down. And if it's actually fully up, they will smash through the rear glass to protect all four occupants in the car. And when I say four occupants, what I really mean, well, officially this is a two plus two, but you'll see when we look in the car that realistically for me, this is a two-seater sports car with two seats that really offer near no leg room at all, other than for the fact they are great at holding extra luggage. Performance was absolutely on par for the key market that DB9 was aiming at, which was the GT, the Grand Tourer. 450 brake horsepower, 420 pounds foot of torque, although the torque is quite late in its peak, around about 4,500 revs. Brake horsepower, power, is reached at around 6,000 revs. It means the coupe can hit 60 in a shade over four and a half seconds. The Volante is a little bit slower um, at, a, at a shade under five seconds to the added weight, which carries just over 100 kilos, so one of me, in addition to the, to the, the strengthening that I've had to do for the Volante models. Top speed of the coupe was 186 miles an hour, de-restricted, whereas the Volantes were capped at a maximum speed of 165, purely to make sure that you protect the roof. There are many things to describe the Aston Martin DB9, but for me, well, I think it is, if it is not the best, it is one of the best ever looking cars, period. It's just a timeless design um, from that 
renowned front grill. Um, it's the sleek looks, the bonnet vents to see get some heat dissipation from that six litre V12. Front brakes are surprisingly the only four pot Brembo um, calipers. Tyres are t at the front 235 40 19s, and these running on um, uh, what are these on? These are on Bridgestone Potenzas. And you look down the side of the car and it's all, sl it's all smooth. The integrated door handle there that you just press to actually open the door. And one of the interesting features when you open the door, not necessarily easy to show on the video, is the door actually opens at an angle that actually raises the door up. So it doesn't open linearly. Why? Well, I assume it's not design. I assume it's to help that you don't, if you park next to a high kerb, there, um, it lifts the door up and away. So again, little subtle touches there. Um, I'm always, I always think coupes look better than convertibles. The Volante is one of the few cars that I do think, whether roof up or roof down, looks stunningly good. The back boot here that gives actually some serious good space if you are going to use this as a weekend tourer there there's enough certainly for two three soft bags plus you've got the seats behind the driver's um, driver's seat uh, seats and at the back that class I, I think the db series it just oozes class and the simple twin exhaust at the back of the car that balance and I'm just, I say, I can't wait to drive the car to see what it goes like. If we step into the inside, and this is where, again, the Aston Martin, it just feels a completely premium brand as it is. You've got the, the plaque to greet you as you step into this car, telling you that it's hand-built in England, the DB9. The handbrake that... I've done a bit of investigation to why the handbrake's on the sill rather than um, in the centre console. I can only assume that it's because they wanted to keep the inside lines clean and simple and that centre section with the uh, where would normally be a traditional handbrake. You've got the electric seats, controls, no shifter for the automatic either. So their buttons up high on the... Um, High on the inter, uh, high on the console, and then a small leather-clad steering wheel with, well, we'll come on to the dials there. The the rev counter moving around in an anti-clockwise. I don't particularly like that, and we'll briefly talk about the analog speedo, which is as good as useless. Zero. Zero miles an hour is sort of at the five o'clock position. 70 miles an hour is at the seven o'clock position. And the rest of the dial is just completely useless. Um, I don't know why Aston Martin thought that was a, a good idea. So really, you've got to use a digital speed. Mm -hmm. And the analog one is, well, for aesthetics only. Because they've done away with having a gear select shifter, and you've just simply got these four buttons with the engine start button, and then you've got this aluminium, scrubbed aluminium, with dials that actually, for me, feel premium. It all feels like it's been put together well. Of course, this looks something more like a sort of a Sony stereo set from sort of the mid 2000s. But this is, you've got to remember, this is pre smartphone, and, which is interesting because actually there's nowhere for a smartphone to go. This, what appears to be a nice dust collector and a coin holder, probably. and really simple really simple not a great um, amount of buttons on this keep it simple i do like the the color the the sort of the metal like it's been chiseled out of metal or aluminium and it's in keeping with the car and then if you the, around wrapped around this this leather clad um, dash here the stitching look at that stitching it's absolutely sublime and it just feels so so premium here if we take a look under the bonnet, um, just try to find the bonnet catch release. <coughs> Quite a narrow 
bonnet, see if we can do it one-handed. Probably not. And here we go. It's really narrow bonnet at the front actually and it's angled back there and there lies the 5.9 litre although it's being put as 6 litre V12 um, Aston Martin on there looks stunningly beautiful um, interesting if you take a look at the front axle you can see here the line that the majority of those 12 cylinders are actually behind the front axle and that's to improve weight distribution get more weight into the middle of the car so you've got little weight out front and if you look at this big expanse here that's to get the don't want weight on the nose of this car get as much back as you can obviously this big chunky strut brace there and braces here just adding that rigidity so you get that driver focused car and then here Again, typical Aston Martin there. Brilliant to show there. Andrew Goff was the final inspector here for this particular hand-built engine. And it's those touches for me that, that pull out Aston Martin away from some of the other manufacturers, some of the other premium manufacturers, those, those touches like that. So, that's a quick canter around the car. Let's now as I normally do, take it out on some testing B roads and A roads and to see what this DB9 is like now as it gets closer to its 20th birthday. You do sit very low down. Um, looking forward, the only thing I can see is the bottom of the, the windscreen. There's no idea of where that long, outwardly stretched bonnet goes to. Um, I suppose in time you, you, you get to know you know that. Steering wheel, leather clad, um, a few buttons but not many. To start the car, and this is some of Aston Martin's underpinnings here, a key that I am sure is from a Ford Mondeo from 2005. So, in fact, the ignition lock looks like it from a Mondeo or Focus from, from 2005 as well. So, rotate it round, your foot on the brake, engine start, and you hear that V12 bellow come in, and wow, doesn't that sound phenomenal. Um, this car, just over 30,000 miles, and it's now nearly 20 years old, so this is only done about 1,500 miles a year. Um, so, sounds lovely. The modern technology, my um, smartphone, there is absolutely nowhere. There's no sort of, not that I've found, any hidden cupboard other than the glove box to put anything in this big expanse here is not really suitable for a phone even even in the door pockets there's a little very shallow but it doesn't look like it's deep enough to hold a phone so for the moment i'll just leave that on the on the passenger seat um flappy paddles we'll try it in both auto and, and with the paddles and see what it goes like so into drive handbrake is off Join me in a few minutes when the engine's warmed up and we're on some better roads.